In late last year, I started watching a YouTube channel called Playing with Power MTG. It's primarily a CEDH channel, short for Competitive EDH, and though I hadn't played high power EDH much at all, let alone competitively, the spectacle of it all, along with the quality of the editing and the voiceover, kept me watching. The first five or so games I watched were really cool, you know, seeing all these expensive cards I'd never played with, these cutthroat plays, these hyper-optimized decks. But then gradually, I started to notice something. It seemed like all of the cards were the same, like the ways the decks gain mana are the same, and the way they draw cards are the same, and the ways they end the game are the same, and the ways they stop other people from ending the game are also the same. This intrigued me, and with this observation, I did what any normal person would do. I looked up the top 10 CEDH decks, and a popular deck list for each, and I compared the lists to see how many cards they shared. All told, there were 20 cards shared by all 10 decks, with 9 of these being lands, 5 being mana rocks, 4 being counter spells, and 2 being card draw enchantments. There were also a number of cards shared by all decks that play a particular color, such as Dockside Extortionist, Silence, and Demonic Tutor. Most interesting of all were the win cons, with the two dominant ones being Bass's Oracle Demonic Consultation, run in 7 of the 10 decks, and Underworld Breach Brain Freeze Lion's Eye Diamond, run in 6 of the 10 decks. Only two decks ran neither of these, those being Kinnon, which generally wins through an infinite mana combo, followed by playing out its entire library, and Sisse, which generally wins through a family of flicker-based combos that it can tutor out with its commander. With this exercise out of the way, I had established that, yes, there is quite a lot of card overlap in CEDH. But why is this exactly? And what effects does it have on the format? The first reason that there's so much overlap is simple. At a competitive level, players want to run cards that are as fast, as flexible, and as efficient as possible. When you're playing a chance-based card game, where you might have access to only a small portion of your deck at a time, every draw needs to do as much as possible. This is also the case for other competitive Magic the Gathering formats, but EDH is different from Modern or Legacy in that it's 100 cards and singleton. This means that, for a given type of card, you need to play a lot more different copies of that type of card than in a 60-card format. If we look at Modern Merktide, it's running 9-ish counterspells in the main board. The MTG Goldfish list contains 4 copies of Counterspell, 2 copies of Spell Pierce, and a single copy each of Spell Snare, Stern Scolding, and Subtlety. A similarly interactive CEDH deck will often end up running 12 or more differently named Counterspells. While there will usually be a short list of potential meta pivots in a format like Modern or Legacy, in CEDH you're already playing the maximum allowed number of your 7th, 8th, and 9th favorite counter spells because you have to. This effect applies to most other areas too, particularly ramp, draw, and win conditions. Ramp is the most homogenous. Fast rocks, rituals, 1-mana dorks, and lands that tap for multiple mana are king here, though decks usually want rocks badly enough to run a couple 2-mana rocks as well. Draw usually ends up being things that abuse either the multiplayer aspect of EDH or the 40 life aspect. Ristic Study, Mystic Remora, and Esper Sentinel are ubiquitous, and Ad Nauseam is so powerful that it blurs the line between draw spell and one card win con. Speaking of win cons, these tend to be overwhelmingly combo based. Underworld Breach and Thassa's Oracle based combos tend to be by far the strongest available due to their low investment and resiliency, and most CEDH decks contain either one of these, or a combo directly tied to their commander in some way. This doesn't necessarily mean that CDH decks are boring in how they win, but it does mean that when you look at somebody's commander and the colors they're playing, you'll often be able to immediately guess one or more of their win conditions. In addition to the previously mentioned reasons, a big contributing factor to why there's so much card overlap between different decks can be seen right at the outset, looking at the top 10 decks. These decks run a lot of colors. There are three five-color decks, two four-color decks, four three-color decks, and a single two-color deck. Fundamentally, this comes down to the fact that CEDH is an essentially budgetless format, which allows for very good mana bases at very little gameplay expense to the player, barring non-basic hate. This, paired with the singleton nature of the format, reducing the number of efficient options available in each color, means that decks will generally want as many colors as possible and only choose to run fewer when there's a great card in the command zone to make up for that loss of efficiency. This can be seen in all of the partner commander pairings that people go with. Are Vile Smasher the Fierce and Tana the Blood Sour insanely powerful cards? No, they're pretty mediocre. 
The reason they're popular is that they let a player run a commander they actively like, such as Timna or Malcolm, and add to it a couple colors they want to have, plus the utility of having an extra playable card in a pinch. The result of this is that a lot of meta decks end up being 4-5 to five color piles of the best cards in the format. These decks can be quite interesting on their own, mind you, as decks with quality synergies and flexible play paths that better use these premium cards will outperform decks whose construction could be described as a jumbled mishmash of assorted and sundry good stuff. But the difference between those two decks can come down to a small handful of cards that the deck then tutors for, rendering these differences subtle on the scale of a deck list. In addition, the realm of what's possible is limited by the sheer speed, flexibility, and efficiency required by the format. Value engines and win cons must be some combination of fast, explosive, consistent, resilient, and compact, and if a deck's game plan doesn't satisfy enough of these conditions, the deck likely won't be able to keep up and pull off wins. This to me might be the biggest issue as you climb to the highest power levels of EDH. The range of possible decks you can build and plays you can make contracts further and further. It's at this point I can hear some of you saying, who does this casual EDH YouTuber think he is to complain about CEDH? Or maybe you were saying that earlier when I was talking about comparing the top 10 decks. Or maybe when you saw the thumbnail before clicking on the video. Regardless, I hear you, and you know what? I asked myself the same question while brainstorming for this video. So I downloaded Cockatrice and played a bunch of CEDH games. And between bullying strangers on the internet with Winota, and conversations I've had with various people who play CEDH, several things about the format beyond the decks themselves have become clear to me, and a lot of them are actually pretty interesting. First of all, there's generally no rule zero conversation, because the whole idea is to be as powerful as possible within the confines of the EDH format. This is nice in and of itself, as a big challenge I've had in casual EDH is the pre-game struggle of putting together a game that's actually fun for everybody at the table. An extension of this is that there's not much salt at CEDH tables compared to casual. The whole idea of the format is that everything is on the table, so when somebody rushes a combo or stacks the table into oblivion, nobody gets particularly bothered about it, other than maybe about the fact they weren't able to stop it. The social aspects that make casual EDH fun to me are still present. Threat analysis, table coordination against a scary foe, trying to curry favor with a potential ally, but a lot of the more negative social aspects, the ones that come from the friction of players having different playstyles and objectives, are eliminated. In addition, another cool thing about the culture of CEDH is the proxy question, in the sense that it's basically a solved issue. The goal of the format is to play as powerfully as possible, so the community is generally very proxy friendly. And some circles are proxy friendly to the point where not choosing to proxy fast mana or dual lands that would make your deck better is considered kind of weird. This stands in contrast to casual EDH, where on the one hand you'll encounter people who get offended by the whole idea of proxying, and on the other hand you'll get awkward situations where somebody proxies a bunch of power cards for their janky midrange deck in order to crush the janky midrange decks of their friends. Having this issue solved so gracefully in CDH, with the answer arising naturally from the format's culture of everybody getting the chance to play EDH as powerfully as they possibly can, is nice. With all this context in mind, I think it's worth going back to re-examine the premise of this video. I started this video with an analysis of the top 10 CEDH decks, and I think it's important to talk about where that list came from. EDH Top 16 compiles CEDH tournament data and ranks decks according to the number of top 16 placements. These are the decks that consistently show up and place highly at tournaments, and on a macro scale, they do represent the format on some level. But the tournaments these decks are pulled from aren't just these 10 decks mashing against each other in pod after pod, and beneath the surface there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff happening here. I'm pretty unqualified to talk about those things as somebody whose CDH career spans a couple dozen or so cockatrice games with random people on the internet, so I'm going to pull in somebody who is more qualified. Hey, I'm the Trinket Mage, and I've been playing in CDH tournaments since 2016. Alex is 100% correct. Those top 10 decks are the most common builds you will see, but there is something to be said about off-meta builds. I've exclusively been playing Jace Friends Prodigy at tournaments since 2016. I just love Manual Storm. On paper, Mono Blue seems unoptimal due to the lack of options. My list, for example, does not run Thassa's Oracle, so I'm able to win through hate like Hushbringer or Torpor Orb that people commonly play against Oracle decks. 
And since basically nobody plays Jace with any regularity, when I go to a new store or play at a Magic Fest, nobody knows what my win cons are or how the combos work. I've won plenty of games simply because my opponents lacked matchup knowledge. Plus, your pet deck can be tuned to be more effective in your personal local meta. For me, I recently included Wipe Away, so I can more forcefully remove permanents without having to worry about counter magic, since my local meta is very blue farm heavy. So don't be afraid to try some lower tier CDH decks. You can still get great results from an off meta build. As the Trinket Mage's choice to run Wipe Away suggests, interaction suites can be a real divergence point in card choice. In addition, there are different decks that will thrive in different metas. Some decks are better against decks which execute their game plan as quickly as possible, some decks are better against slower decks which try to be flexible and grind value, and others are better against stacks heavy decks. Depending on the composition of decks played at a given place at a given time, it can be highly effective to run decks that wouldn't normally be considered top contenders. As a final point in this section, I think it's interesting to think about some of the weirder implications of the CEDH meta, ones that specifically derive from the predictability of top decks. Praetor's Grasp is a card commonly played in Ad Nauseam decks, because as long as there's at least one similar deck at the table, it's effectively a grim tutor with upside that also pulls a pivotal card from an opposing deck. Mnemonic Betrayal is an even more powerful example of this idea. Since decks often share so many cards, in a lot of games it effectively becomes a better Yawgmoth's will. As a third example, Ragavan effectively offers a downsideless outpost siege effect. It would suck to exile a Demonic Consultation or Underworld Breach off the top of your own library on a turn you're not ready to play it, but when it's your opponent's library you're gambling with, hitting a card like that is all upside, since either you can go for the win, or you can just let your opponent's win outlet go to permanent exile. You will also see cards that get put into a deck for one purpose, but a given situation might call for a different one. Bergy, a great mana generator, can instead be cast as a draw engine if a player really needs a way to dig through their library during a given game. And a famously spicy part of CEDH is the Forbidden Tutor, wherein a player uses Demonic Consultation, a popular combo piece, for its original purpose, as a highly risky tutor. I find these sorts of use cases really fun, as they turn the ostensibly bland card diversity of some of CEDH's top decks on its head, inventing new use cases for existing staples. This video has been a bit of a journey, because painting a picture of a whole format is an inherently challenging task. I'd encourage anybody who is interested to give CEDH a try, since it's a pretty unique MTG experience. It's also just about as proxy friendly as EDH gets, especially if you use a program like Cockatrice, where not owning the cards is already built in. My feelings about CEDH are mixed, because as a format it has some pretty cool attributes, Individual decks are stuffed with interesting plays and synergies, and often represent the pinnacle of a given archetype. Games are fast-paced, complex, and exciting, with battles for the stack often containing five or more spells and abilities. And yet, there is a sort of cookie-cutter blandness to it when it comes to card diversity, and more interesting options for draw, mana generation, and closing out a game will often simply lack the raw efficiency to be fully viable. For these reasons, among others, I personally don't enjoy CEDH as much as casual, but I think an understanding of the CEDH format can give a lot of insights into how to have more fun playing casual. As far as deck building goes, I think an idea a lot of people take from CEDH is that playing the best combos will make your deck better. And while this is true in the sense that it might make you win more games, it's not a useful fact for having fun with casual EDH unless you like those combos, like actually like them beyond the novelty value, and unless you can find opponents who enjoy playing at a table with those combos. CDH decks have game plans that they're looking to follow, but a decent portion of games end with a combo being pushed through either earlier than people can interact, or at an opportune moment when the table is depleted of resources to respond with. This is not to say that this is a bad dynamic, and indeed it invites lots of interesting strategic and deck building choices but these choices naturally come down to how to win a competitive game of Magic the Gathering more so than how to optimize a game plan in the traditional sense, and I'd wager that following a cohesive game plan to its conclusion is what a lot of people find fun about Casual Commander. To me, the more applicable lesson to be taken from CEDH is the card quality filter. Running cards that are more flexible and more efficient, cards that consistently feel at least decent to draw, will improve your deck. Basically, minimize dead draws, and if cards rely on other cards to be good, 
their effect needs to be very strong to make up for the amount of time they'll sit dead in hand. What an efficient or flexible card means will differ deck to deck, but prioritizing these things will improve your deck's overall functionality. Finally, I think CEDH can also serve as a lesson for why casual EDH can be difficult to have fun playing sometimes. CEDH games are generally friendlier and less salty than casual EDH games, in large part because player expectations are aligned from the outset of the game, in the sense that everybody is there to win at all costs, and deck power levels are affixed at the most concrete value, as high as possible. This is certainly not to say that playing at that power level is the way to have fun playing EDH, but it is to say that aligning expectations and power levels before the game is a step that exists in casual EDH, an unsolved problem that is presented any time four people walk up to a table to play a game of Commander. EDH is a social game, and the way to have more fun is by talking to your opponents more, both during the game and before the game even starts. Thanks for watching, and big shout out to the Trinket Mage for helping out with this video. A link to his channel is in the description if you want to go check his stuff out. I also have an announcement which is that the patron deck I randomly selected to be reviewed next week is Grohl Control. So that should be cool and fun. All right, bye now.